All right. Here we are again, another installment of the Jack Star Guitar Hour. Uh, this time I got a special guest, Walter J. Hey, Walter, how are you doing today? Great. Man? How are you doing? Man? Good. Hey, thanks for coming on the show. It's really good to have you. I've seen you play a lot uh, in the Brevard County area. And um, even though you're not originally from here, are you? No, no. I came down here less than three years ago. Where are you from exactly? I'm from Maryland, Baltimore. Cool. Very cool. Yeah, and um, I have to say, you know, it's an honor to have you on your really uh, one of the best players out here. Definitely. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Doubt, I appreciate man. that. And um, so what we're going to do today is keep it real loose, you know, just have some fun, play guitar. And um, that's also because I never bothered to really plan anything. I was one of these kids in school that, you know, did their homework the last minute. You know, you know the deal. <laughs> so anyway, um, let's start off by doing a slow blues song and hearing you just wail out a bit. How about we do like a Texas Flood? Okay, that's great. Do you do it in what key? In G. G, let's do it. Thank you. 
All right. <laughs> um, uh, that was cool, man. That's a, how long have you been playing that song? I've been playing Stevie Ray Vaughan stuff since 97. Okay. So, you like this guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. As I didn't know who he was until 97. Okay. As a person, <laughs> would you like him if you met him as a person, judging by everything you know about him? Yes. Okay. I met him once. Oh, well, that's even... By accident, but I met him once. Very cool. So, here's my take on Stevie Ray Vaughan. I'm not a huge... Um, I don't really know a lot of his songs, but I am a huge fan of Stevie Ray Vaughan. It seems that when he plays lead, it's very rhythmic, as opposed to Clapton, who it's very much like a solo thing. And, we're blah, 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 blah. and Stevie, it's more like... There's <laughs> always right. that... Chuck -a, chuck -a, chuck -a. Yes, that's it's his right hand technique that made him. That actually so made it's the right him. hand thing it's that he does. The right hand technique that he uses. It took me a couple of years to to grasp that technique. And the other thing I noticed about Stevie that I really like a lot is he's very innovative with the chords. It's not always you know your typical. You know, it's always like. And it's always that pushing the beat with the right hand. He and, and yes, he likes to include the rhythm with the lead while he's playing at the same time. He's a three-piece player. It's a true three-piece player. Could you show us right now the correct way of playing Pride and Joy? Because everybody plays it wrong, and I know you play it correctly. Uh, yeah, I actually uh, was in a contest in 2000. Mars Music Centers ran a nationwide contest. Mm -hmm. I actually won nationwide for doing Pride and Joy note for note. See, I didn't know that, but I heard you do it, and the guitar player me came out and said, you know, this is really weird. I didn't know you, and I said, this guy is actually playing it correctly. Right, so, it's a tough beat. So show us what it is that he's doing. All right. Here we go. That is it. That's it, man. That is the more. That's it. Now, I've heard every other version of that it's from everyone. And, you know, and then, of course, some people choose not to play the rhythm. Let's say if, it's, if you're Bonnie Raitt or you're whoever and you're doing a tribute album, right. you know, you might just go, you know, or whatever, you know, and it's all, and it would be good, but it wouldn't be playing. It wouldn't be correct. It wouldn't be correct. <laughs> exactly. Now, I, I came up with a blues thing that has a pretty good um, kind of rhythm. It goes like this. And I was trying to tap into that kind of thing, uh, which I really didn't, but it was close. You know, it was just You're like, very close. You're yeah. very close. It's just that whole rhythm. Then I came up with another one, which went like this. You're articulating all these chords, you know. But let's do this. Let's. You, there's another side to you besides the Stevie side, isn't there? Oh yeah. There's the classic rock, the writer side. The like you were in a punk band too. Oh yeah, I was in a punk band for six years. All underground music, Marble Bar, the whole deal. I loved it. We played 99% original material. And you were doing like what, like stuff like. I mean, influenced by like the Pistols, or Pistols, the Clash. Ramones, Clash. Unbelievable! I love that. Um, I love that. I still can some of that stuff still in me, note for note. Well, you know what, I, and this is what I think is really important, and I want to say this to people that are watching. I don't think it's good to limit yourself to one style of music. And when you play things like, like people get a kick out of the fact that I play heavy metal, and I also really like blues and classic rock. I think like some of the styles teach you certain things. Like uh, in your case. The punk music gave you the ability and the aggressiveness yes. to rip. And Stevie had that aggressiveness. Clapton, when he came out, I mean, you know, they were using 
tons of martial amps and the guy had hair like this and you know wearing psychedelic clothes and um and then you know it's, he became clapton he became the mellow guy that you know that does this you know but it's important to realize that he wasn't always like that and the passion that he has came from the other you know stuff that he was into and i think that applies to me and you as well it applies right? to a lot of musicians that simple science of it all is a lot of musicians fight emulating other people and i am the opposite i believe emulating is what gives you the diversity to create absolutely and uh emulating other people is a lot of people a lot of musicians believe that being themselves and playing originals and this and that is is uh is so much a different plane as opposed to emulating a great artist but right. to be perfectly honest emulating a great artist is probably the toughest thing a musician could ever do yes absolutely and uh all artists themselves including the ones that we like to emulate started off emulating someone else too it's like, it's like one time I was, I, this guy was telling me, he goes, you know, uh, I don't play covers, I play songs because every song is a cover. Yes. Unless you're John Lennon or Robert Plant or whoever, when you play, and, and you know, <laughs> everything's a cover. If you didn't write it. It's, it's all been done before. Yeah, and even, even, <laughs> and even your songs that you actually write, yes. if you didn't write them 100% by yourself, still a cover it's still a cover and you know and you can just cover yourself well still in all the years of learning when you write someday you realize that you can play your original song and play it on a on a cd all you want and someday you're going to realize that what you wrote sounds like some cd from someone you've had learned before exactly and we'll do a whole show one day on that. a style you know we'll do a whole show about how where all this stuff comes from because it's fascinating I think you and I both know that there's not a lot of totally original stuff under the sun. I'd like us to do a song now. Uh, this one's called Feeling All Right. Do you ever play that one? Yeah, I've played that before. Uh, can you sing it? We'll can sing it together. I'll do a verse. I'll do a verse. Sure. Okay. Sure. So uh, I did it in C. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. 
Walk into a bar, there'll be a cover band, and chances are they know it. They know that and Mustang Sally, which we're not going to do. But here's, but, <laughs> <laughs> but here's the cool one. Uh, I like to do this song. It was a hit a long time ago, and uh, I do it kind of like what I think is kind of like the way Stevie might have done it if he had ever decided to do it. <laughs> is kind of groovy. I call you up and ask you, babe, if you want to see a movie. First you say no, you got some plans for the night, and then you stop and say, all right, love is kind of crazy with a spooky girl like you. Keep me guessing, I never seem to know what you're thinking. If some guy looks at you, it's sure your little eyes will be winking. Well, I get confused, I don't know where I stand. And then you stop and say, All right, love's kind of crazy, a spooky girl like you. All right.
Cool. Snoopy. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and I think sometimes it's interesting to try to envision like how somebody would do a song that they didn't do. You know. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, it's like it's like trying to say, well, how would uh, I don't know? How would Clapton play? You know, some Neil Diamond song. You know, it's just the whole thing is so absurd. But then it makes you, I think, tap into, well, who is Clapton? Right. Well, That's if it. you tap back far enough, you can look at how uh, Deep Purple did a Diamond song. They did Kentucky Woman. Great okay. example. Stevie Ray did Taxman, Beatles Taxman. Right. Which totally makes sense uh, because Taxman has that, that chord that some people call the Hendrix chord, you know. <laughs> And the weird thing is, like, a lot of the Stevie Ray Vaughan songs had that chord, didn't they? No, a lot of them did. He took it another step, though. He took right. Taxman to a whole new level. Yes, if you've yeah. ever heard it, his chords on Taxman are... <laughs> that's how he's doing it. Wasn't in E. What, what, what was that in? That is in C sharp. Cool. I got faked out. I thought you were playing in E for a second. There. <laughs> um, here's a cool riff in D. Play, play some lead to this. Thing. I just came up with this the other day. Let's see what you think of it. Sound a little to you like Tush, or did it, or not really? Yeah, it's got Stevie Ray's edge to it. I like okay. it. Okay, I like it. Because that song came about, I was thinking about the fact that ZZ Top has a song called Legs, and they have another song called Tush. So I was thinking, well, what part of the female anatomy did they miss? <laughs> and I thought, well, boobs, but I didn't call the song boobs. I called it headlights. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. You want to take a break on that note? Yeah, on that, on that note, we're going to take a little break and let you guys out there in internet land ponder the meaning, the great cosmic meaning of this whole thing. And we'll be back in a little bit. <laughs> All right.
All right, we're back. We got Walter J, and we're gonna do some more blues and some more guitaring, you know? Because that's really what the show's about. There's nothing really planned out, and I'm glad that you're cool with that, you know? Um, and it's, I think it's better, I think it's more honest, and unfortunately, there's less and less of that over the media. Everything today is scripted. In fact, it's like, you know, it's like presidential news conferences. I mean, everybody's got their questions, and, and you can only ask a question at those conferences if it doesn't offend anyone. So, so this isn't like this. There's nothing scripted here. Um, anyway, we're talking about Stevie. Uh, yeah. You wanted to do that song by that Buddy Guy wrote. Yeah, his version of a Buddy Guy tune, um, I believe, um, and I'll say this honestly, I believe that Stevie Ray redid one of Buddy Guy's tunes and literally a lot of Stevie's lead guitar playing, a lot of his style came from Buddy but, Guy. Yeah, I kind of noticed that too. Uh, like when he does like, uh, well give us a couple of Buddy Guy signature riffs that Stevie has used. Okay. <sighs> Is a perfect buddy guy okay. riff right there. Also Sim here, right. That's all. That's a, all straight from Buddy Guy. The other one that I hear him do a lot oh, is this one. I hear that everywhere. Yeah. You know? So anyway, and that but that first one. Very understated. Do that one one more time. Can we get a camera on the fingerboard? Basically, he's pulling up and hammering down here. He's going. Okay, one more time, like a little slower. That's it, man. <laughs> that's, that's Buddy Guy right there. That's the whole thing. So, yeah, I think it's cool. The other thing that I liked about Stevie, because, you know, we're talking a lot about Stevie today. He used a lot of open notes. Like if he was an A, like he would do riffs like. You know, so there's always. And what's cool about that is if you're only, let's say you're in a three piece, like I've seen you play in three pieces, um, it sounds full. Yeah. So as opposed to, you know, just single notes, you know, which I think Clapton and Beck are more like single note kind of guys. Uh, Santana's definitely a single note guy. Right, right. Well, they they like that full band. Stevie's always been three piece up until the album Texas Flood. And that's when he brought in Reese Winant on keys. Right. So Texas he was three Flood. piece right. up until then. Okay, uh, one other Stevie question. Okay, you've got two brothers growing up in Texas. You've got Stevie and you've got Jimmy Vaughn. Jimmy Vaughn was playing guitar probably years before Stevie did. And Stevie looked up to Jimmy. Um, why didn't Jimmy become Stevie? Why did Stevie push ahead of Jimmy? Stevie Ray Vaughan more or less stuck with, stayed with concentrating on his blues, what he was going to do with it, the artist that he emulated, and he pushed and moved forward. And I firmly believe that Jimmy Vaughan went with the fabulous Thunderbirds and kind of limited himself okay he limited himself while stevie excelled and a lot of what happened with stevie ray his fame is attributed really to um david bowie absolutely yeah and the weird thing is that bowie, a lot of that bowie i think played him paid him very little to play at the us festival right i think it was like i mean i don't even want to say it on the air it was so so cheap on david bowie's part that let's put it this way there are cover bands out here in this county <laughs> that made more than Stevie Ray Vaughan made at the US Festival. And it's yes. just, I can't figure that one out. I mean, it's okay to be cheap, but not to that point where you give somebody playing the US Festival, I think it got like $300 or $500. It was anyway, let's do You Better Leave My Little Girl Alone <laughs> or Leave My Wife Alone in the case of... <laughs> leave My Girl Alone. <laughs> You better leave. You better. 
better leave my little girl alone
That was cool, man. Great song. It's not a typical blues song. I was thinking it was more like a Red House or It's My Own Fault. And it really is. A, especially the first time that I played it, and then as I was playing it with it, I realized, you know, this isn't a typical blues song. No, no. He does a lot of progressive changes in there. They're pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. I got a little stumped right on the air. But that's okay, because, you know, it's all part of... Uh, it's all good. It's all good. Um, talking about blues and, you know, guitar heroes, you know, obviously Stevie Ray Vaughan's like a guitar hero. Who are the other guys that you like, I mean, besides Hendrix? Because I know you liked Hendrix. Very first guitar player. I was really, really into, and still very much into, Joe Perry from Aerosmith. Really, wow. really love the way he plays. I love Aerosmith, point blank. Anything they do, right. I'm good with. Cool. Uh, the other person for his uh, slide work and his um, talk box work is Joe Walsh. Oh, yeah, he's great. Like Joe Walsh, Joe Perry, and Stevie Ray Vaughan, they're pretty much the three. Well, the two Joes I wouldn't have guessed, but they, but you know, now that you mention it, I mean, Joe Walsh is really phenomenal. He's a great player. Phenomenal player, tasty, you know, and just great. You know, as far as uh, I would thought, you would have liked like maybe Jeff Beck and Clapton, and uh, mm, no, never, so never, never really a Beck Clapton fan, never. And what about uh, the Reverend Gibbons? <laughs> 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 you gotta like the Reverend. The Reverend. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I hear I hear some Billy in you. Yeah, I hear some Billy going on there. We do a lot of ZZ Top. The yeah. band does a lot of ZZ Top. So in a nutshell, play some signature Billy riffs. <laughs> you know, if I came down from outer space and I said, "Well, who, who's Billy Gibbons?" You know, how, what would you play? Let's think. What could I do? Would it be the squealing, maybe, or I don't know. Ah, like his uh, earlier work, like in um, when they did songs like Heart It on the X, uh, Nasty Dogs and Funky Kings, that kind of stuff. That's the kind of his. Right. That is a signature Billy lick right here. It's hard to catch. It took me a while to figure out, but the way he slides one finger from the G up to his A major, it's like right. That is yeah. signature Billy Gibbons, which is also the beginning of Suffragette City by Bowie. Bow uh, now. Okay. But anyway, I, I don't think he got it from Bowie. No, no. I don't think so. But it's all, it's all good. We see, when I think of Billy, you know, besides, you know, Tosh, I think of all the squealing. Oh, yeah. All that kind of squealing and sanity. But, you know, but he's a great player. It's just that he gets into that, you know. And he starts squealing and... To me, he was like the second guy I heard do. The first guy was Leslie West from right. Mountain. Right. right. Mississippi Queen. He was doing a lot of... Wow, wow, wow. And then he would do like... Wow, wow, wow. All that kind of stuff. So now that we've chased the history of rock and roll guitar for everyone out there in internet land, we're going to play something. How about... Um, how about we do like Rock Me Baby? Because I think everyone's done Rock Me Baby. Probably Steve Ray Vaughan's probably got a recorded version of it. Does he? I Is he the only one that hasn't? Probably the only one that hasn't done it. Uh, okay. Um, I did an A. Well, rock me, baby. Well, rock me all night long. Well, rock me, baby. Well, rock me all night long. Keep on rocking me, baby, until my back ain't got a bone. Roll me, baby. 
Roll me all night long Roll me, baby Roll me all night long Keep on rocking me, baby Until my back ain't got a bone Walter on the guitar Rockin' me, baby Rollin' me, baby Rock me, baby Rock me all night long Keep on rockin' me, baby Till my back ain't got a bone This is the part of the show where we'd be trading this. It's gonna be difficult because there's no bass play, but we can do it. when you got it into a house, Stevie would play <laughs> the song, and it was so true. It was, it took it from back, doing it very linearly, you know, you know. And then you did it syncopated. Mm, and did it with a... Right. And that's it, man. In a nutshell, you know, that's, it's adding that extra syncopated thing 
And um, it's kind of weird because like the Red Hot Chili Peppers did that in one of their songs. Uh, it was uh, the song by Stevie Wonder, something about higher ground. Higher ground. Thank you. Do you guys want to take a break? Yeah, we, we will. So there's voices that give you answers on this show. Did you notice that? Is that great? Or From what? beyond. Voices From beyond. beyond. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. It was higher ground. And uh, I'm wondering, you know, that song, uh, and Stevie Wonder had that. I mean, who came first? Was it the Stevie Wonder song or, or Stevie Ray Vaughan? I have no idea. Are you talking about superstition? Well, that no. too. But I was thinking higher ground, which has that, that kind of syncopated thing. Right, yeah. right. Anyway, we're going to take a break, and we'll solve the mysteries of the universe. It must be the quiz back. question. Is that the quiz question? That was the, yeah, that's the part <laughs> where you get a brand new Gibson Les Paul if you answer correctly. <laughs> okay, we'll see you guys in a few minutes.
right, we're back again with this week's guest, Walter J. So, Walter, we've been doing a lot of playing, um, and most of it has been blues oriented, but I think you can basically play blues to anything. You know? I could probably play Maui Had a Little Lamb and you play some blues for us to it, right? That's it. So, like, <laughs> in fact, I think somebody did that already, right? Stevie Ray Vaughan did that. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, anyway, uh, I was thinking we'll do, um, can you sing Knocking on Heaven's Door? Is that one? Okay, let's do one. Pieces that, of it. Um, let's do something that would be uh, cool to do. Did you ever hear of a guy named Elvis? Mm -hmm. Did you like any of his songs? I love Elvis. You love Elvis? Okay. Elvis is great. Okay, then I can be friends with you. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Elvis. There are two kinds of people in the world. People that don't like Elvis or don't get him. And people that get him. I get it. I know. I think he was great. I think he was great, too. The marketing was incredible. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's, that too, man. Um, so, let's do an Elvis song. Um, I don't know. What's a good Elvis song to do? Have you, did you ever perform any Elvis songs? Yeah, probably Hound Dog or something. It's pretty easy. Can you sing it? Most of it. There's a much to it. Let's do it. Hound Dog. <laughs> Now, which whose version do you want? <laughs> Let's do our version of it. All right. I don't remember. Is it an E or I? Do it an E. Do it an E. You know, we could, do, we could start it off real bluesy because uh, Hound Dog was originally written by Big Mama Thornton. And you know, anybody with the name Big Mama Thornton is going to be doing blues. And she was a big woman in the 1930s, and she had the hit before the king of rock and roll. I think she did it kind of like this.
right. <laughs> anyway, we digress, but not really, because, you know, I mean, how all this came to be, you know, if he hadn't happened, probably the Beatles wouldn't happen, and probably Stevie Ray Vaughan wouldn't have happened, probably we'd be looking at a different country right now. A whole new world. It'd be a whole new world. It might be, might be worse, it might be better, we don't know, but it would have definitely been different. So I think that, uh, I think we're really just defining, uh, more than music when we play music, we're really talking about the culture. Yeah, it's a big diverse culture. Definitely. Between the British invasion, and then what I consider one of the first blues bands, British blues bands, to me, was the Animals. Oh yeah, definitely. One of the first British that's, real blues that's true. bands. Yeah. yeah, we were doing the House of Rising Sun the other day, and that's kind of, uh, you know, as bluesy as it gets, you know. Uh, and it was just a great song uh, to do, you know. I know you don't play this song live, but let's do a little bit of The Thrill Is Gone, because, uh, I'm, I mean, did Stevie Ray Vaughan ever play The Thrill Is Gone? I'm not sure. I've never heard him do it. No. Did something similar, and that was This Guy's Crying. Very close to The Thrill Is Gone. Is it really? Okay, I didn't know They're that. very close. That's, that's interesting. But, I mean, uh, you can't really talk about blues without somehow getting B.B. King involved in the whole thing, because he really, you know was the most popular blues guy ever. Great voice. Great, yeah. You know, just and singularly was in charge of the single note lead. <laughs> well, exactly. BB King. It's, yeah, it's not that vibrato, you know. It's like a bee sting, you know. Yep. You know. And he does it everywhere. And then he does this thing a lot. Always goes... But um, it's, it's really weird because all guitar playing is a synthesis of everything. Like, I mean, I just noticed, like, doing this kind of bend is very Jeff Beckish. Just like, and also pre-bending, when you bend before, you know, like... You know, so you, you, know, you mix all these styles together, you know, this... You know, the B, B, and then you mix that, and then you mix the... the exaggerated vibrato, which is Clapton. I mean, Clapton's vibrato is just sometimes, the only word you can find for it sometimes is it's like it's exaggerated. But then B.B. does it, you know, and uh, Freddie King and all those people. But let's take a stab at uh, Thrill Is Gone, because it's a great song. Turn to the key.
You know I'm free now from your spell Don't you know that I'm free, baby You know I'm free from your spell You done me wrong. All I can do is I wish you well. what Stevie will do. We'll bring it down to a whisper. Just like Stevie. one of the songs you do live, I don't think. It's not one of the ones that... No. Well, it sounds like... Uh, working on it, though. We're working on it. We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the works. Uh, well, here we are. You know, I got Walter J. next to me, and now I got to ask him just one or two really important guitar questions. And the really basic question that you can ask anybody doing anything, if you were building the shuttle, I would probably ask you the same question. Why... Why do you play guitar? Uh, this is a. This goes back to my childhood. Basically, I met my um, sister's boyfriend who had come back from Woodstock. Okay. 
he taught me a couple chords, you know, a D chord, A chord, a G chord on acoustic. He saw something in me. He saw something. He gave me that guitar, that acoustic guitar. I took six months and sanded it and refinished it and restrung it and made it beautiful. Cool. At the time, I lived in a pretty a family in disarray, let's call it that. Like a dysfunctional family. Oh, yeah, a very dysfunctional family. And um, my uh, father was obsessed with me not playing guitar. He was obsessed with me not playing. Literally, that guitar was uh, broken over my back and made me watch it burn in a fireplace. Wow. And from that point on, I just started building my own guitars. I learned how to build them. And every time he'd break or burn it, I told him I'd build two in its place. And it became a love and an obsession that has carried with me since I was 11 or 12 years old. Yeah, that was very intense. You know, you never know <laughs> how people are going to answer those answer kind of questions. questions. But it seemed like it was I didn't want to answer it, but hey, <laughs> no, <was> you asked. <laughs> no, it seemed like it was a test of wills between you and your dad at the it time. It was. And is your dad still alive? Yes. And you think it, he would like this show? Yes, he would. In fact, it took until 2005 when I opened in Camden Yards actually was the headliner in Camden Yards at Oriole Stadium in front of 7,000 people. It took until I was that old for my father to come up to me and say, I'm proud of you as a musician. It cool. took him that long to say that to me, cool. and I respect him for it. Right. It took many, many years to, to hear those words from him. Hey, some people don't give compliments easy, and they don't, they're not no. encouraging, but in the end, when they do come around, it's really a, a great you know, thing. And, you know, I can it is. I can see that, that you're still reliving that moment when you talk about it, and uh, it's very, very cool. I think we got a few minutes left. What does the voice, the om omnipresent voice, say? <laughs> uh, we're, we're almost out of time. All right, we're going to end this show. It's, it's been great having you on. We're going to end with a little shuffle in the key of C. can be I am ready red as anybody can be well I'm ready for you baby I hope you's ready for me Walter.
Hey. Have a great show, Absa. Thanks, Walter J, for coming down, man. Thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure. Thank you so much. We'll see you guys again next week.